Happy Bastille Day. Bet you didn't know it was Bastille Day. I didn't know it was Bastille Day until I walked out uh, down the street to get a sandwich. And uh, every year there's a French restaurant called Circle Rouge that does the Bastille Day thing. And they had bocce balls and foosball. But anyway, you're watching I Love Photography, uh, in case you're wondering. And as usual, my co-host, Sarah Jacobs, happy Bastille Day. Thank you, Alan. Happy Bastille Day to you as well. I don't even know what Bastille Day. I think it's <laughs> I, a, I think it's like the Fourth of July for France. It's hard to keep up with all the holidays and every everywhere else. If you're joining us uh, on YouTube, hello. Uh, you're watching the video. Good to see you. If you're joining us uh, through iTunes, you probably found us by searching for "I Love Photography," which is awfully close to the hashtag where you can reach us. Hashtag I Love Photo. So send us questions, comments, ideas, criticisms, or a happy Bastille Day greeting. And with that, we have plenty to talk about today, Sarah. Like, I don't even know if we have enough time. I, I don't either. In the whole day. In the whole day. Uh, <laughs> I should point out that we did not coordinate our matching gray V-neck t-shirts today, but in fact, we are both wearing... Maybe this is the new official outfit of I Love Photo. Oh, maybe it should be. Hmm. I'm rocking Madewell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what this. I think. Uh, I think I got this at. Uh, I, don't, I have no idea. Uh, big. Uh, a big deal uh, every year when it comes out because it makes people stop and look at photos and talk is uh, the ESPN bodies issue. And this year, no different um, in terms of like the quality of photos that we saw. And also no different in the discussion of body types of these athletes. Of course, Serena Williams has come under fire before for being a very muscular woman playing on the tennis circuit, where historically the women, you know, you think back to uh, Martina Navratilova, who, who was even for her time like considered jacked. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the traditional tennis player was kind of tall and lanky and then... Uh, Serena came along, uh, this is Venus, but the uh, Williams sisters came along and they were just like super strong athletes. But ironically, the one that uh, got people talking the most was of Prince Fielder, the baseball player. Uh -huh. um, which is funny, right? Because normally you would say, okay, here's a naked girl on a surfboard, what's the, what's the deal? Or here's a BMX guy, blah, blah, blah. And you go through these images and you see Prince Fielder, who is a slugger. And, you know, when I think, here he is. And this was, this was the cover for a lot of people. And a lot of people said, oh, my God, why did you put this? I can't get this out of my head. <laughs> and in the article, Fielder said, you know, the, the, the cool thing about sports is that there's no one body type and that you can be successful you know, depending on the specialization of your body for that sport. And it was funny to see criticism of a guy who's like one of the top athletes in the world being like, oh my God, avert my eyes from this guy's body. It shows you how distorted the view we have of idealized bodies and how, how unrealistic they are. And the discussion of all of this stuff, first of all, I, I thought the photos were, were, were great. Uh, for the most part, across there, there are a few that are like, eh, yeah, okay. yeah, there are a few that I'm a little disappointed in, which we yeah. can talk about. Yeah, uh, but for the most part, it was great. And and in the discussion of Prince Fielder, I thought back to discussions I've seen about how you know a female Olympic gymnast might be four eight ninety pounds, a jockey might be a hundred pounds, uh, NFL offensive lineman might be six three three fifteen. Uh, uh, NBA center might be 7 1, 250. And I thought back to this uh, photo from Howard Schatz, oh, wow. um, his book Athlete, and how he photographed all of these athletes um, against black, seamless, and then he put them all together just to see the variation in body type that you have. So you see like a sumo wrestler versus a gymnast. Um, and all of these guys are world-class athletes. So it just got me thinking a lot because I thought it was, it was silly to be, you know, as they say, body-shaming professional athletes yeah. because of these photos. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really ridiculous and does show just how we view 
bodies are how we think we should. And athletes are good reminders that there's no wrong way for your body to be. Um, and also the capability of the body and how sculpted you can make it, which is great. The, the photo series, I, I think it's interesting that they didn't get one person to shoot everybody. Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot of people in a lot of different places. Yeah, yeah. But I, I almost feel like there needed to be a little bit more consistency between Here. the photos. Go to, if you go to the thumbnail view, you can kind of see, like, the variations and um, of the photography. And I actually thought, I was disappointed in Martin Schollers, who shot the two people on the, on the motorbike, the couple on the motorbike. Yeah, it's a little <laughs> not serious, which maybe, you know, for for motorbike, that's fine. I, I really like this, uh, the cliff diving stuff. Yeah. I the Venus Williams stuff was good. I always love the surfing stuff, you know, being from Hawaii. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the, you know, it's interesting to see the, the para athlete. This, this one disappointed me the most just because it, yes. it has and very I, little to do with sports. Yeah, and I was really, I had the exact same thought as I clicked upon it, and I checked out, and the, the photographer is a female, which made me even more disappointed. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes yes and no, right? I mean, good that, unfortunate that it's a woman's perspective, but fortunate that it kind of doesn't really make a difference in some ways, but I totally know what you mean. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I, I mean. Thought... I, I, I think I think again the, the the magazine has been very successful in initiating conversation about bodies. Yeah, yeah. I think it and in a much more positive way usually yeah. besides the comments about you know the baseball player <laughs> yes. in a more in a more positive way than let's say the swim edition of Sports Illustrated. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So uh, hats off to ESPN again for another great year. Um, look forward to how they're going to surprise us again next year. Um, I think it's probably been maybe two weeks since we talked about the selfie. Oh, no. Oh, no. Here it's we high go. high time we talk about the selfie, then. <laughs> well, it's almost not talking about the selfie, but how the selfie doesn't even cut it anymore, Sarah. And I didn't realize this because I still see a lot of people taking selfies. <laughs> um, but, but this article in the New York Times is talking about how uh, I don't know, people, I, either internet famous people or people who fancy themselves as being internet famous are hiring photographers to do glamour shoots so that they're portrayed in you know, a more glamorous light. I mean, I guess it's great for photographers that their work is being appreciated. But the problem that I have with this sort of generally is that as if our lives online aren't manicured and curated enough that now we're trying to be movie stars. Right. In a lot of ways. Yeah, with our own fashion, fashion-esque spreads. Yeah, or just, you know, trying to over-stylize every photo that we take um, and making every photo just, you know, instead of mean, being meaningful to us, we try to make it meaningful to everyone else and we try to get validation through likes or retweets or favorites. Mm -hmm. And I think that it kind of takes me back to this concept of personal project where it's not for anyone else but but for you. So what am I I don't even know what I'm trying to say. I, I'm saying I'm saying that like for all the advice that we give people about like if you want to be successful on Instagram, you have to have consistency in uh, subject matter and style. I kind of threw that out yesterday when I was thinking about this because I was like, you know what? Instagram isn't for for me, my Instagram account is more of an account of my life rather than trying to impress people with how good my mobile photography is. Which, and the, and the fact of the matter is, I'm not very good at mobile photography. <laughs> no, I'm not either. So yeah. maybe that's just an excuse because I'm a crappy mobile photographer. <laughs> that could be. I mean, a lot of these people who are getting these glamorized shots are business owners, and so they're claiming, you know, I I need these professional shots for my business, but you know it's just all for vanity and you know they just want the likes and the comments yeah yeah uh, silly trends here's another silly trend uh, speaking of mobile photography another article in the times talking about how uh, the plating at some restaurants is getting very sophisticated 
because they want people to Instagram them and, and push the restaurants into the social sphere. And uh, Pete Wells, who's uh, one of the two Times critics for, for dining, uh, says, you know, it's not, they might look pretty, but they might not taste that good. And so now, uh, again, like going back to like, what's the point? Is the point of eating to be satiated, to like have good flavors in your mouth, or to like have a visual feast? And I think Pete's point is that this is getting a little ridiculous. Social media can make or break restaurants, unfortunately, but I think that chefs ought to be more concerned about the taste of the food rather than the look of the food, or at least the look of the food should be secondary to the taste. Right. Well, they, they mentioned the cronut in this, um, in this article, and the cronut was many times over blown up on social media. Um, but... I but feel the cronut's like the cronut, delicious. Yeah, exactly. The cronut is good just on its own. <laughs> like, it's not even that photograph. Like, I don't know, that photographable. No. Yeah, disclosure, Dominique Ansel, the inventor of the cronut, uh, is an acquaintance of mine. But, you know, the, his stuff is great. So it's, uh, oh, did I humble brag just now? <laughs> I think I might have humble bragged. Yeah, you 100% did. <laughs> okay, well then let's switch topics to another. Well, we're not switching topics because we have one more, and it's Anthony Bourdain, who everybody knows from Food Network or CNN or whatever network he's on nowadays, uh, talking about how food Instagramming is really about one-upsmanship, about like, oh, this is where I'm eating tonight at this fancy restaurant, and look at this uni on top of a truffle, on top of a rare porcupine on top of sliced grizzly bear. And I think he has a point to a certain extent. You know, there was a time that my, my mother called me up from the car. My dad had just gotten a new car uh, for the first time in 15 years. And they were taking a ride to sort of break in the engine. And she, I guess she was bored because she called me up and she said, Alan, your Instagram is boring. <laughs> I was posting a lot of food photos. But... I wasn't trying to one-up people. I was actually, that's actually how I remember, in some cases, what I've eaten. You're like, oh, what did I eat that day? I mean, we have Peter on our team here at Photo Shelter. He takes a picture of his lunch every, every day. day. But he's been doing it for, I want to say, years. years. Yeah, years. years. With his DSLR, not with his phone. It's sort of like the everyday Noah Kalina with lunch. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, well, enough of that. Enough of that silliness. Um, no, there's more food silliness to come. Oh, yeah. Why don't we talk about that food silliness? Here, here so, you go. Yeah, so, Alan, you might know the inventor of the Corona, but, yes, I, know of, you know. but I know of this guy named Mel Chef. Um, and the, this work reminded me, uh, or the articles about it, Instagramming food made me think of Mel Chef, who kind of pokes fun at the culture of uh, Instagramming your food, which everyone is doing now, and and people just being foodies in general. Um, so he he photographs for Vice Munchies, and it's just this disgusting snapshot esque food. Uh, it's not it, it's not appetizing at all. Uh, it's just gross. <laughs> As, as of, most Instagram food photography is not appetizing. Right, exactly. But this takes it to another level of, <laughs> of nastiness. Uh, and, and the snapshots of just the plates almost kind of remind me of like very early Stephen Shore work. Um, uh -huh, uh -huh. But anyways, yeah. Male chef, check it out. It's disgusting. The silliness on the internet. I, you know, it always makes me uncomfortable seeing people used as tables and or chairs. <laughs> right, well, I, I don't know, know why. It's, I don't yeah, know it's, why. It's very uncomfortable, but that's a man sitting on a man, so it's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> God forbid it was a man sitting on a woman or a woman sitting on a man. Right. But man-to-man -man table sitting is fine. Totally fine. Uh, it seems like um, communist countries really love Photoshop propaganda as much as we do in democratic societies, <laughs> but we don't Photoshop our armies. We Photoshop our women whereas they Photoshop their armies. So I know North Korea has done a lot. And this was uh, China uh, protesting the protest. Uh, so in Hong Kong last week, there was a big democracy protest. Um, and China wanted pro, to assert pro, the fact... Pro-democracy. Uh, Pro-democracy, pro yes. Yeah. Pro-democracy protests. And China wanted to protest the pro-democracy protest. 
but I guess either people really didn't care that much in China or, or, or you know, people just didn't feel comfortable going out and protesting for whatever reason. Um, and so it turns out that the propagandists over in China just photoshopped a lot of the same people in very obvious ways. I, that's what I don't understand. Like, try to at least make it slightly more convincing than putting, you know, as you can see, the, uh, the girl in the blue circle is one person away from herself. <laughs> well, I think what I'm, I'm most confused about are the sparkles, um, the sparkles added yeah. to the photograph. Yeah. I feel like that's kind of the tip off of like, all right, this might be uh, digitally manipulated. Might be, might be manipulated. <laughs> yeah, that's not a, a Tiffin star filter <laughs> right. uh, on the image. Who knows? It's, it's funny anyway. Um, remember how we talked about Getty uh, allowing non commercial entities to embed uh, like 20 million of their images for free? Oh, yeah, we talked about it at length. We talked about it at length because it was such a big deal when it came out three months ago, and it was a situation where we said, you know, they're doing it for big data purposes, so they can see where these images are, and then they'll have they'll be able to collect data because the embed code is on these sites, much in in, in this very similar way that you know Google Analytics can collect a lot of stuff because you put their code on your website, or ads can do the same thing. And I was a little skeptical, I think, at the time because I just didn't know that enough people would know about the service. In this Forbes article, they are now saying that in three months there have been 100 million embeds of this content. Now, remember, there's only 20 million images out there that they've released, and they're saying there's 100 million embeds. I, I'll come out and say it. I don't believe it. Yeah, that doesn't the math doesn't sound right on that. <laughs> I mean, if 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 they have accomplished that, then you know, you gotta tip your hat to them because that's exactly what they wanted to happen. They wanted to say, we can't monetize these images. There's too much theft at the you know twenty to one hundred dollar level for online web usage. So we're gonna flip the equation and without coming out and saying it, they they said, you know, the, the implication was the big data is gonna be more worthwhile. And if they've accomplished it by actually doing 100 million embeds, then I guess they prove their point. They know what they're doing, much to the the dismay of photographers. Right. Exactly. But I just have I have trouble f believing that number, Sarah. I don't know what to tell you, Alan. <laughs> I <laughs> so a little controversy there. Maybe more. Hey, if somebody at Getty knows something about that. Why don't you DM us with hashtag I love photo <laughs> or yeah. something like that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. More controversies. Sarah, remember I wrote that, uh, I wrote a blog post a few months ago called The Sad Tale of Jasmine Starr and Doug Gordon. Yep. Uh, and that sort of recounted how both of them had recently been caught plagiarizing other people's work. Um, and not photos, mind you, but text tweets, blog posts, and not like a little bit, but a lot. Multiple instances, etc. Both of them apologized. Doug came out and said it was his sister-in-law or his sister or something like that. They, they were uh, uh, prevented from speaking at WPPI uh, this, this past February. Water under the bridge, right? Fine, you know, you, you, you make a transgression, you pay the price, then we move on. I'm cool with that. But then the guy gets caught again, plagiarizing again, and as a result, Nikon kicks Doug Gordon out of its ambassador program. Just kind of yanked him, didn't say anything, just pulled his image off, and you know what? Good. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Seriously, like, you didn't learn your lesson? Yeah, people need to be writing their own content. <laughs> and I noticed that... Um, Jasmine Starr actually just this week made made the top 30 list of the most influ influential photographers online. Yeah. You know, does she deserve that? I don't I don't know. It was a it was an interesting it was an interesting list looking at that list. Um, and maybe we'll we'll bring that up uh, next week. So it was a collaboration between a marketing firm and who was who was the company? Do you remember? 
I'm blanking. It's another. It's a photog. It's an industry company that 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 it was smart to do. I think it it got a certain amount of buzz uh, in social media. And the typical names, uh, you know, the Chase Jarvis was there, the Vincent LaFerre was there, David Hobby was there. Joe McNally. Um, Joe McNally. Uh, just interesting to see the list composed of a lot of people who are internet famous but don't necessarily have a body of work in the way that a Joe McNally would have. And a lot of people commented and said, hey, you know, this is the era that we live in. Like, it doesn't, you don't need to have 30 years of experience and have paid your dues anymore. Uh, all you need to be is a personality. Yeah, or just, they could have retitled, I think, what the list was, because even Andy Adams of Flack Photo, I mean, he tweeted out, he was like, I don't even really consider myself a photographer, but I made the list. <laughs> So yeah. Stuff like that. It's like they didn't do the background checks exactly. And all, but I must say that our very own Todd o Young, there's an extended list. It's actually 100. Yeah. Um, was number 99. So hats off to him. Well, and Todd is a photographer, and Todd shoots a lot of stuff, and he writes reviews on a lot of equipment, and he has a pretty dedicated following. So. Absolutely. He writes not so all surprising. original content. <laughs> <laughs> that we know of. That we know. No, no shade. No Todd. shade. No shade. No shade. <laughs> um, yeah. So so interesting. Um, the New York Times Lens Blog, among others, reports a new interim member at Seven Photo. It's their first uh, member in China, which I thought was really interesting. And my computer is frozen. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so a new interim member, and they talked about how. Well, that's working, but I can't actually move the content. Um, there we go. So Sim Chi Yin uh, was part of the a mentorship program under Marcus Bleasdale, who sort of mentored her for the past three years, and now she's been offered uh, interim membership into the Seven Photo Agency. And I got to say, you know, first of all, obviously, you have to have a presence in China nowadays. Um, such an emerging economy, such a huge economy, so many people there, 1.2 billion or whatever it is, and such an interesting time in that that culture because uh, middle class is growing. Um, there are obviously signs of some democratic tendencies, uh, although it's still obviously very much government controlled. But wonderful photos, really yeah. wonderful photos of you know the culture. And I just think it's it's a it's a great appointment, and hopefully she'll uh, make it into uh, being a full time member. Yeah, after five years of trying to work for that, I would hope so. That's crazy that she had to do a mentorship for three and then two years <laughs> interim. She's really got to prove herself. <laughs> yeah, I love this photo, kind of illuminated yeah. by a flashlight at dusk with the iPhone or whatever it is, also illuminating face. So some really, really nice work and a well-deserved appointment there. Over on TMZ, you know, uh, a lot of celebrities have these agreements with paparazzi to not take photos of their kids, which is totally understandable. It's one thing to be uh, in the public eye and make your, uh, uh, your income that way, and if you're a movie star, obviously, you know, there's a lot of perks of being a movie star, and you understand the trade-off of having the paparazzi come around. Um, the White House has had an agreement with a lot of paparazzi not to take photos of Malia and Sasha outside of official events. Turns out Malia is in L.A. doing a uh, summer job or internship, and she was photographed while she was out by the AKM GSI agency. And they got a phone call from uh, Mrs. Obama saying, please take that down. Um, and I know this, this, is the, uh, this is the industry terminology. I just thought it was not super appropriate that the email that the agency sent out is urgent set kill notice <laughs> on the Malia Obama photos. Yeah, that title is a little confusing, especially when you're dealing with the White House. Yeah, just not, yeah. 
Maybe Consider, should... Also, considering the, the 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 number, the increase in uh, death threats that Obama has gotten. Yeah. So, yeah. It's just a little... Exactly. Not the best uh, selection of words there. And while we're on the subject yeah. of, of paparazzi in L.A. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, why don't you tell us? It's also, it's time for the drone portion of our, of our, of our series uh, today, which is Miley Cyrus noticed a drone hovering over her L.A. home, and she took an Instagram of it and posted it, which I just feel like is kind of a slap in the face to the paparazzi. It's kind of like, you know what? Yeah, you got a drone, but you know what? I have a ton of followers on Instagram, way more followers than you do, and I'm just going to film your drone, and it's going to get way more likes. <laughs> I just feel like this is a... its The drone stuff is kind of starting to get out of hand a little bit already. It's out of hand. It's out of hand. I, like, you and I both, like, months, just a few months ago, we were like, what's the big deal? But you know what? He, this is the big deal. They're flying it over private property. It's intrusive into people's privacy. I mean, it's a, it's a little not great. Well, and, and I would also argue, not that I'm a huge proponent of drones, but I would also argue that, you know, we, we talked about the woman on the beach who assaulted the photographer who was flying the drone. Right. And people's reactions are also disproportionate. That's true. Uh, there was a NY Post cover that we both looked at, or Daily News cover, the other day with, uh, with drones on them. And the story with that was that two guys were flying drones, and the NYPD claimed that the drone almost hit a, a police helicopter. And so they, they arrested these guys and slapped them with some, well, I forget what the charges are. And then they listened back to the, the audio recording of the helicopter pilots, which basically indicated that the drones were nowhere near the helicopter, and that the helicopter actually started following the drones and that the police couldn't decide on what charges they would even charge these guys with. So, yeah, I mean, this is clearly a situation where technology is moving way faster than, our, than, than society's ability to sort of process what we should be doing with it. I think it's unfortunate that paparazzi are flying drones over celebrities' houses, because that ruins it for everyone. On the flip side, we've seen footage of stuff that we could have never seen before. Yeah, the video that came out this week of the drone up with the July 4th fireworks oh my God, was, was incredible. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So, I'm sure we'll find another drone to talk about next week. <laughs> oh, I don't <laughs> doubt it at all. <laughs> uh, more celebrities in the fo photo news realm. I, I don't know this show. I don't really watch reality TV. I guess... You, you know, I, no, <laughs> this was actually sent to me by one of our client uh, services associates, John Gorman. He mm -hmm. found this. Um, Little People, Big World, pretty sure this was on TLC, uh, really big hit. Anyways, one of the twins, the sons of the, of the family, um, is actually a photographer, and he actually takes really great photos. This photo of this cowboy, amazing. Nice photo. <laughs> I really like it. And not only that, but he uses photo shelter to display his work. Well, well then we definitely like him. Yeah, I mean, of course. <laughs> that's all I wanted to well, say about cool. him. that's cool. You see? So you can be the son of little people and still grow up to be a big-time photographer. Was yeah. that, that was a horrible pun. Yep. I retract that pun immediately. Okay. <laughs> um, over in uh, Esquire... You know, freaking Lance Armstrong. Freaking Lance Armstrong. Freaking Lance Armstrong. You know, Texas boy. Yeah. That's your boy. I know. He I don't, such I don't like that. an inspirational figure for people. You know, he overcame testicular cancer. Then he went on to win like six more Tour de France. Um, inspired tons of people. Partnered up with the Livestrong. Raised millions and millions of dollars for this vehemently denied for years that he was doping or cheating, and then there was just an over-preponderance of, of evidence that he was doing that, and then he came clean. Um, I mean, just a tragic story. And uh, But so here's an article in Esquire, and just really nice photos by Joe Puglis. Yeah, I it really is. like these photos. It is, but, you know, I, I still... I think he's a little bit of a glamorized cheater. 
he still cheated. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, he's like a he's a good looking dude. Yeah. He still has. I, I guess the the counter argument is that almost everyone in cycling at that level is cheating, because that's the only way that you could survive. So the fact that he still won six in a row is pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, I I'm guess. Not, I'm not justifying. I'm just saying, you know, like there are certain sports where you know people are doping, like 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 bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. And if a guy can still win the bodybuilding championship six times in a row or eight times in a row or whatever it is, it's impressive on some level. Does that mean he? <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Does that mean I, he used more dope? I don't know. <laughs> maybe he's genetically predisposed to be even better at processing the the steroids. I don't, right, whatever. right, right. My, exactly. my larger point is I really like his photos. Yeah, the photos are gorgeous, even though That's the man gorgeous. in them. Uh, I don't questionable, know. questionable ethics. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, over on Slate. A really, really cool series by Susanna Robb on... Pull it, pull it up for us. ...our uh, overconsumption. This is uh, what America's supersized fast food culture looks like, starting with this ginormous... I mean, that's got to be like 64-ounce cup of uh, whatever it is. Whatever it is, it's too much sugar. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think he's putting water in that. Yeah, I don't think that's water or tea or green tea in there. <laughs> uh, but 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 such a great series, uh, you know. This is why I love like the photojournalism and and, and stuff because you get these scenes of culture, and you're gonna look back in a year, five years, twenty years, and being like, what the hell were we thinking? <laughs> I know this is a this is a great example of a personal project. Yeah, and it, it varies a lot too. It's not. I love that it's not just people in the fast food restaurants. You know, it's not just people sitting there eating it. It's it's the entire culture from like county fairs to people ordering through the drive through like this, this is one ridiculous. on their wow yep <laughs> got so the caption on this one incidentally is so taco bell drive through daytona florida 2006 quote i bet you've never seen this before said the customer at the taco bell drive through <laughs> window yeah i hope i never see that again yeah with a motorized wheelchair that that actually, you know, I've tried to walk up to uh, drive-through windows before, and they won't serve you. Ah, it's such a shame. It's a shame. You have to have a vehicle for for liability and safety reasons. They don't want you to get knocked over. It's too bad you didn't have a motorized wheelchair. Um, speaking of culture and fast food waste. Yeah. Here's Greg this, Siegel. Yeah, this series uh, by Greg Siegel, his trash series, this was circulating around, and a lot of non-photo industry people were posting it on Facebook, so I always like to pay attention to what other people outside the industry are liking. I saw these, and initially, I, I don't really like them, like, as, as a series. The people look incredibly awkward. Um, laying down their overhead shots of people in their one week's worth of trash. Um, the, and some of them are floating in water, and all the trash is floating in water with a black Which is backdrop. Weird. It, it, it is weird. I'm not sure that I really like it. Um, but people, it's like people didn't really know how to pose. Some are posing like it's a family photo, and they're just lying down. This is probably the best one of the girl in a bathing suit with all of her cigarettes and pizza boxes, and she's smoking a cigarette while laying in her own trash, which is definitely the, be the strongest shot of the series. <laughs> so what do you think resonated with non-photo industry people that it got passed around so much? Well, this idea of our consumption and realizing how much trash we actually produce in only seven days, I mean, that's a great message. So that message, that part of the series, I, I do appreciate and I like. Um, but I think people were just baffled by, oh, yeah, we produce this much trash in such a short amount of time. Yeah, it's kind of, it's gross. But I, but I, I agree with you in that, like, the photos didn't, the photos made me a little uncomfortable, which perhaps was the point. I guess, yeah, and yeah. You should step back and be like, what is going on? Right. 
Interesting stuff. Interesting. You stuff. think about your own trash. You're like, oh god, what's in there? I, well, you know, I order in a lot for my meals because I, you know, I live by myself, and it's kind of a pain to cook for myself. I mean, the amount of trash that I generate is staggering. Oof. I do feel a little guilty about that. I, I, I often ask, you know, when I pick up stuff, I often don't ask for a bag. Don't give me a bag. I don't need the bag. Do my little every part. Little bit, yeah, every little bit counts. It adds up. That's our environmental message for today. <laughs> And this Don't is our F-16 message for the day. Sergeant Larry Reed Jr. Uh, has a dream job. Uh, at least some people will consider it that. I, I think it's pretty cool. He's the official photographer for the United States Air Force Thunderbirds, which means he gets to fly in a jet next to the Thunderbirds and take photos of these jets in formation. And the cool thing I like about the spread here kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier. It's not just dudes flying planes. It's sort of the culture around the air shows and kids sort of getting into it. And here's a graduation photo, which is I just love this shot. spectacular. You know, it it's a great shot, but seeing the woman's face in the bottom right corner, like to me, that sort of gives it more of that, that human element to it. But yeah. just perfect, perfect moment in time there. Um, some maintenance guys working on it. These are just really, really cool shots. And I, I have to imagine that it's not easy to take photos when you're, you know, pulling a lot of G's in a fighter jet. Right. Is he, like, doing this up? No, he couldn't be doing this, up. yeah, out the window, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, they, they, they shoot right through their glass window, but, okay. yeah, I mean, it's just kind of amazing. Cool stuff. Here's a refueling one, which is never really safe, so... Yeah, Sarge, that's just some great some great photos. Great photos. Our last piece of the day, ending on our customary humor. This has been around for a while, but uh, it, it came up in social media again, and I just, I, I think it's funny. Uh, so Pierce Theo and his wife, Stacy, 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 <laughs> um, have a Tumblr called Will It Beard, which was the result of kind of like a, a party trick almost, but he stuffs things in his beards like toothpicks, pencils, candles, and plants. And then he posts it on his Instagram account or his Tumblr account. Um, here's some spaghetti. <laughs> this one made me laugh out loud, the spaghetti. Yeah. And here's that animated gif of the spaghetti. And, you know, some of them are just not that attractive. Like here we have like a bunch of disposable razors. But I got to say, like some of the plant ones I really liked. Yeah, this, they gross me out a little bit sometimes. The Q-tips coming out of the beard. Yeah, that's gross. But you know what? This guy is very... He should be very grateful that he has a supportive wife who, who thinks his beard <laughs> is fun. <laughs> <laughs> this, I mean, the, the toothpick one kind of reminds me of like a grizzly bear for some reason. That must have taken a very long time to oh place those. That's like a por That's a porcupine on his face. Yeah, it is a porcupine. I, but there, there's one uh, not in the, the series of photos that we're looking at right now, but where there's sort of a garland of flowers, and it's it's beautiful. It looks kind of like an upscale J. Crew ad, to be honest. Oh, that's lovely. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's so special, an upscale J. Crew ad. <laughs> well, that was an awful lot of photography to cover this week. Oh, it was. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, hey, Sarah J., are you on vacation next week? I am. I'm going to go to oh. Europe. Yes. Well, have a great time. Thank you. I'm We're going to miss you. Photos. I'll miss I you guess, guys. I guess I'll have to get one of those other guys. Oh, yeah. Or Chris or somebody. All right. Somebody less magnetic than <laughs> yourself, but we'll, we'll make do. We'll see you in a couple of weeks then. All right. Thanks. So for Sarah Jacobs, this is Alan Murabayashi signing off for another episode of I Love Photography Live. See you next week. Bye-bye.